to the Joanne Michaels Show. I'm honored to have with me tonight our Congressman Maurice Hinchy. Thank you very much for coming. And just because so many of us are confused about redistricting and districting, can you explain exactly what your district is? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's Ulster, but in Duchess I, and Orange, I get confused where you who you represent, really. Sure. Well, in Dutchess County, uh, Joanne, it's uh, only the city of Poughkeepsie. So I represent the city of Poughkeepsie in Dutchess County. Then it goes across the Hudson River and uh, includes all of Ulster County, all of Sullivan County, most of Orange County, the cities of Newburgh and Monticello, um, Walk Hill, Montgomery, Crawford, and then uh, goes uh, east there along the, the Pennsylvania border over to Broome County, includes the city of Binghamton, um, places like Endicott, Johnson City, goes over to uh, Tioga County, to uh, the town of Owego. It goes almost to Elmira, not quite to Elmira, mm -hmm. but almost. And then it goes north up to uh, the southern Finger Lakes and includes the city of Ithaca in Tompkins County. Oh, and about how many people are in the district? About uh, 650,000 people. Okay. Mm -hmm. The reason I asked you to join me is I think that so many people are confused about what it means when these huge corporations are buying up newspapers, radio, and TV stations. And when we met, earlier this year, you said you were going to a conference in Madison, Wisconsin, and that you also, at that uh, event, explained very well to me what this means for the average American, why it's such a dangerous, frightening thing, uh, and, and all of us should be concerned. And I was hoping maybe you could explain that to the viewers. Well, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try as best I can. I, I think that uh, well, first of all, we live in a, a democratic republic. We live in a, in a country where an informed citizenry is essential to the fundamental operation of that government. People in this country are required or asked or qualified to vote for the people that represent them. And you have to have good, solid information in order to base your judgments uh, upon good, good information. And uh, that requires, I think, a, a diversity in the media. If you have a situation where you have only one voice or just a few voices, then you're less likely to get the kinds of information and the diversity of viewpoints that are, are needed to enable people to come to sound and solid decisions. Now, traditionally, we have had a uh, media in the country, both newspaper, print, and uh, electronic, radio, television, and now the Internet, which is very, very open and um, which has a wide variety of opinions and comes from a variety of places. But since, oh, the 1980s, early 1980s, mid-1980s, we have seen an increasing consolidation of the media into fewer and fewer hands. In other words, the, 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 the Federal Communications Commission, prompted in many cases by federal law, has allowed a handful of people to acquire more and more radio stations, television stations, newspapers, cable television, the internet, so that that wide diversity of points of view that we, we were accustomed to in, in America is shrinking. And you have... Um, like Rupert Murdoch came well, here and he brought up so many different... That's in the 80s. Yeah. And well, Rupert Murdoch is an, ex is an example of it. He's purchased a lot of uh, newspapers and other outlets. But, you know, you have uh, General Electric, you know, Westinghouse. You have uh, corporations that own the major networks and then more and more private independent stations. And book publishing, general, you know, it, that's also another arm of it as well. Book so it's, it's all the media. Magazines, newspapers, yes. So the, the, the point is that we should be concerned, I think, about a situation where you have a handful of people who, because they are, have access to large amounts of money, are able to purchase more and more television stations, more and more radio stations, and you get a, a homogenization of points of view all across the country. You get one piece of information, one approach, one viewpoint, one philosophy, over and over again. You see it um, in some of the major networks. For example, Fox. Now, Fox uh, claims to be fair and balanced, but we know very well that Fox uh, has a point of view which is 
what, what would be called in Washington, I suppose, neoconservative or very right wing, particularly with regard to foreign policy, but on domestic issues as well. MSNBC, to a certain extent, as well, has a, a particular philosophy that is more or less right wing. And uh, both of those stations, Fox particularly, um, position themselves to explain the circumstances created by the present administration. They are, they are apologists for the, for the Bush administration. And uh, I, I think that that is something that we're not accustomed to, really. We're, 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 what we're accustomed to is, is objective reporting. When you turn on the news, what you expect to hear is a person telling you what's going on from an objective, nonpartisan, non-ideological point of view. But increasingly, that's not what we're finding. We're finding that that person is, is speaking to you from a very partisan, very ideological perspective. Can you give an example? Because I think the average person, they are so busy and wrapped up trying to make a living in this very, very difficult economy. Many of them don't really understand this. They think it's a lot of highbrow uh, talking. So they say, well, what happens, happens. And I turn on my TV, and that's what I see. So what, can you give an example of how something happens and how it's reported and how it's distorted? or? or it's, it's shifted in the way it's presented. Can you, well, for an example? The, the issue that we're talking about, for example, the issue of consolidation in the media is something that's not reported on at all. That's why I'm doing it, because yeah. I'm trying to learn more about it, and I, I think it has been mm -hmm. neglected. I think the only reason I'm doing it is because no one's paying me, no one owns this show, you're not getting paid, <laughs> there's no money here. So that may, maybe that's why. You're well, right. I, I think that it, it's true that programs like this are the only programs that air this particular issue, consolidation in the media, because the main media outlets aren't interested in having people know about it. They're doing this pretty much under the radar. Uh, this has been done very, very quietly and without um, a lot of uh, information going out to the general public. As I said, it's been going on since uh, the 1980s. Let me give you an example. In, uh, when the Federal Communications Commission was established back in in the 1930s. They were set up in order to provide a situation where people were going to get good, solid information and a diversity of points of view. In order to, to ensure that that was happening, they, they stipulated that the airwaves are not owned by any individual or any corporation, but the airwaves are owned by all of the people of the country, and that the airwaves that are owned by all the people in the country are administered by the government, and the government sets up an agency to do that, the Federal Communications mm -hmm. Commission. The Federal Communications Commission allocates parts of the broadcast spectrum to particular corporations, particular broadcasters, so that they can communicate over that, that part of the spectrum. But they don't own that spectrum. They don't own that part of the spectrum. They have it uh, from the FCC for a particular period of time, and during that period of time, in the past, they had to demonstrate in order to renew their license, and the license had to be renewed every six years, in order to renew their license, they had to demonstrate that during the past six years, they have behaved in a way that is consistent with the general public interest, and that what they were doing was consistent with keeping people informed, not from an ideological point of view, but from a broad-based, nonpartisan, fair and objective point of view. And if they couldn't demonstrate that, they were in danger of not having their license renewed, and someone else would get the license, and then they would broadcast over that particular spectrum. As part of that requirement, the Federal Communications Commission set up something called the Fairness Doctrine, or as it is also known, the Equal Access Clause. What that required is this. If you owned a, uh, a broadcast corporation, and you were broadcasting either radio or television, and you had a particular political point of view, and you broadcast that polit political point of view, someone in your listening or viewing audience then heard that and had a different point of view. They came to you and they say, look, we appreciate that you were broadcasting this particular point of view. For example, you may be for the war in Iraq, and you were saying that it was very justified for the government to go to war in, uh, in Iraq, and everything that we've done there is, is entirely appropriate and right. But the person who comes to you has a different, a different point of view. They think that it wasn't fair that we went to 
war in Iraq. They think that the Congress should not have, uh, for example, given carte blanche to the administration mm -hmm. to uh, allow it to declare war and do war wherever it wanted to and to conduct this kind of activity uh, outside of the uh, United Nations and in a, in a unilateral way, etc. And they wanted to have an opportunity to express that in contradiction to your philosophy as you editorialized it on your station. The Equal Access Clause required that that be done, that you give that person an opportunity to, to do so. Well, the Equal Access Clause was struck down in 1987 by the Reagan administration. The Federal Communications Commission under Ronald Reagan eliminated the, uh, the Fairness Doctrine or the Equal Access Clause. And so since then, people have had a great deal of difficulty in getting another point of view expressed on the radio or on the television. That has, now that was done very, very intentionally. It didn't happen accidentally. It was done very, very intentionally. And did the Congress allow that to go through, to slip through? I mean, was the it Congress voted did on? Not. The Congress did not allow it to go through. The Congress, uh, after the FCC made that ruling under the, under the Reagan administration at the direction of President Reagan, the Congress then passed a law, passed by both the House and the Senate, overriding that saying that you had to keep the Fairness Doctrine. That law then went to the President, the President vetoed it. And the Congress, in order to override the veto, would have had to have two-thirds of the vote, and they weren't able to get two-thirds of the vote because there were Republicans in the Congress in both houses that supported what President Reagan did in that particular case. So even though the Congress fought it and passed a law that uh, would have reinstated the Fairness Doctrine, President Reagan vetoed that law. And so, as a consequence, we have had it ever since. I don't now, remember anybody getting bent out of shape about this. Well, it, it, was, it was inadequately reported. Exa I, I, that's my point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't remember it being, I mean, it's absolutely frightening to think that something like that just went through. Well, I share that sentiment. I think it's frightening also. That's so why that's I, why Fox can have the way, present things the way they do. And yes. I just Without the fear it. of someone coming to them and saying, now, wait a minute, I have another point of view. I represent this group of people. We would like an opportunity to have that point of view expressed. They would have to consider that. In many cases, they would have to allow that position to be expressed. But the Fairness Doctrine being eliminated, they don't have that requirement anymore. So that's, that's the problem that we face. Now, I, as a member of the Congress, am trying to overcome that. In the face of trying to overcome that, the Federal Communication Commission under the Bush administration is now going even further. Up until uh, early June of this past year, for example, there were stipulations that said if you were a corporation uh, and you, you could own uh, the television stations, but they could only, they could only broadcast to 35 percent of the audience. In other words, you could have, you could, you could have access to 35 percent of the audience but no more than that. The Bush administration, the FCC under the Bush administration, raised that to 45 percent. We fought that in the Congress, both houses. And in the context of an appropriations bill, we were able to roll it back to 35 percent. However, as you know, the Congress is now do dominated by the Republican Party uh, in both houses. So are you saying or are you intimating that Republicans are, are more to limit the, the information, to, to yes. in other words, well, don't you think that people out there should be complaining about this on the local level? I mean, this is very dangerous. It's, to me, it's like, you know, TV's the opiate of the masses, and it's that people see things on there, they don't think it's a point of view, they think it's information, factual information, and as you know, many things presented are not even true. Yes. So, to have one point of view presenting facts that aren't true a lot of the time is scary and people, I mean, I don't know, I guess only, what, 25 percent of Americans vote anyway, so maybe nobody cares. But. Well, about 45 to 47 percent of the, of the eligible people generally vote. A little less than half of those who are qualified to vote voted in the last election. But what you're saying essentially is right. and. 
the Republican Party nationally, now I'm not talking about Republicans here in our area because I think Republicans here take a different point of view with regard to the issues like this and the environment, things of that nature, but the national Republican Party is a very, very conservative, very right-wing entity uh, on issues like the environment, for example, but also uh, on this issue which is fundamental because if you can restrict the information that people get, if you can have all of the ideas essentially eliminated and only one or two or three ideas more narrowly focused presented to the public, then, and, and they're consistent with your belief and your philosophy, obviously you're going to have a better chance of getting your ideas passed through and become law and dominate the way the country behaves. And that's essentially what, what we're seeing here. Yes, it's the Republican Party that has been in the forefront of this attempt, which has been very, very successful to limit the number of voices that are out there in broadcasting and in print, and to limit and even eliminate the possibility of ordinary citizens having the opportunity mm -hmm. to, express, to express their point of view or their philosophy over the broadcast spectrum, even though that spectrum is owned by all of the American people. It's not owned by CBS or ABC or NBC or Fox or MSNBC. They don't own anything with regard to the broadcast spectrum. They own the studios, they own the broadcast equipment, they hire the people, and they pay for all of that. But the spectrum, the portion of the broadcast spectrum over which they, they, they broadcast, well, that is owned by the American people. But it isn't, because if I wanted to take this show that we're taping here right now, and put it out on CBS because it's of great interest to every American. Every American should hear what you have to say on this subject. I wouldn't have, they would laugh me out of the studio at CBS. <laughs> well, so, right. so I guess what I'm saying is that I think the ideal of it being the airways are owned by the people, the people don't, the people with the money, General Electric, the people who bring you, you know, bring bad things to light most of the time, I guess. Those are the people who own the airwaves. Ivory, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, well, you're, um, you're, you're, you're speaking practically. I'm speaking in terms of the law. In terms of the law, the, the, the public owns the airwaves. But in terms of the practical use of the airwaves, what you're saying is essentially correct. As things have developed since the 1980s, in effect, these people who, who broadcast over that spectrum do own that part of the spectrum because they're not supervised properly. The Federal Communications Commission doesn't examine the, what, they, what they do from the point of view of openness, objectivity, fairness, operating in the public interest. All of that is not being done the way that it was supposed to have been done and the way that it, that it was originally set up. But could a lawsuit ensue based on this travesty almost? Like because it's not being, I mean, are there legal grounds to sue well, the FCC? I, 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 I mean, I, I, what you're telling me, somebody ought to, <laughs> the lawyers are so busy making money off everything, this is actually a good cause. Well, this would be a cause in the public interest, and I think that uh, it may be possible to bring a suit that would be successful here. The other thing, of course, is to have an election which elects people who are committed to having an open broadcast network and who are, who are dedicated to having all points of view expressed and not having it owned by special interests. So what we're seeing is the broadcast system, means of communication, newspapers as well, are increasingly controlled by a handful of people. And as I was mentioning, this June 2nd decision by the Bush Federal Communications Commission has made that even more so. They've en enabled broadcasters to control a larger section of the, of the, of the system. They went from 35% to 45%. That was overturned in the House of Representatives and in the Senate on votes in both houses. But then, in the context of a conference committee, under the influence of the White House, that number was raised to 39%. Mm. And it came back to both houses in, in a conference report in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the form of this big omnibus budget bill that was just passed. You remember that just recently. The Congress passed this huge appropriations bill. And in that huge appropriations bill, which contained appropriations for more than a dozen of the cabinet offices in, in Washington, it also contained provisions dealing with this federal communications uh, initiative and the, the uh, amount of the public that can be addressed by one entity, one corporation. 
It, in other words, it went from 35 percent up now up to 39 percent, not to 45, but at up, compromise. But, but up to 39. It was a kind of compromise, mm -hmm. but it's a compromise that was done in a way that was inappropriate because it, the compromise had already been rejected by both houses of the Congress. It was only in the context of this uh, conference report where, where members of both houses come together and they allowed themselves to be influenced by the White House. You have a monolithic government in Washington. Now this is something that people ought to keep in mind. You have a monolithic government in Washington currently. You have the same people in control of the White House as control the Senate and the House of Representatives. And you have in the leadership of the Senate, Bill Frist, who's the majority leader mm. of the Senate, and Tom DeLay, who is the essential leader of the House, even though Denny Hastert is the speaker, Tom DeLay is uh, overwhelmingly the most, the most influential person in the House of Representatives. Both of those people, Bill Frist and Tom DeLay, are um, dominated by the White House. They listen to what the White House wants, and they provide, to the maximum extent possible, uh, cooperation with the White House. You may remember that uh, uh, the, the leader of the Republican Party in the Senate was overthrown recently, and Bill Frist was, was brought in. Trent Lott was Trent the former Lott, right. leader of the Senate, but he was too independent for the White House. And the White House worked in a way to get him out. Well, in other words, that little so-called racist comment that Fox blew way out of proportion. What you're saying is that they actually used the media to get rid of somebody they wanted out. Yes, they used, they used the media to get rid of someone who was of their party, but who was independent within their party. Someone who recognized and appreciated the need for the Congress to be independent of the executive branch, who recognized the importance of the constitutional separation of powers, and who recognized the sanctity of the independence of the Senate as Trent Lott did. He was not as easily influenced as they wanted the leader to be, and so they maneuvered him out. They used that, uh, that uh, uh, allegedly racist remark to maneuver him out and to bring in someone who was much more compatible with what they wanted to do and who would listen to them more closely and more completely. So you have a monolithic government, the White House dominating both houses of the Congress, and to a large extent the courts, because mm, that's what's most, of the court, most of the court appointments over the course of the last uh, two decades have been made by uh, Republican presidents rather than by Democratic presidents. So we are in a situation presently in our country which is very unusual in our history and I think very dangerous, very dangerous, where you have increasingly one particular point of view, not the broad range of points of view that can be found within the Republican Party normally, that is normally housed within the Republican Party. For example, people here who are Republicans in upstate New York, uh, many of them are very sensitive with regard to the environment. Uh, many of them are very sensitive with regard to free speech and openness and things of that nature. But the National Republican Party is very different. And they are the ones who are in, who are in control of this, what I'm, what I'm referring to as a monolithic government, which is controlled by these neoconservatives in the White House. People like Carl Rove. Well, Carl right. Rove is the ideological leader there, yes. And within the, within the defense establishment, people like Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz and uh, Richard Pearl, people like that who represent a, a very skewed point of view, way off to the right wing of uh, the uh, political spectrum. That's the situation we find ourselves in today, and that's why I think we're having such difficulty, both domestically and in, in, the, in, the global, in, in the global environment as well. Well, one, when you said you were going to Madison, Wisconsin to this conference, mm -hmm. which was dealing with this subject, people came, I presume, from all over the country. Yes. Right. What was the consensus there? Were, were people, did, did some Republicans show up for this thing? Mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah, yeah, some Republicans did show up for it, absolutely. How do they justify, or what is their feeling of it being positive that there were fewer points of view allowed on the television. Well, the what do they who, say, how do they see it? The people who came to that conference, Democrats and Republicans, were opposed to this consolidation of the media. That's true. It was a, I remember reading there were a lot of Republicans who were, who were against this whole thing. They were vote, when that bill was coming up, and mm -hmm. there was, I remember reading about that because they realized how dangerous it is. I, I'm not that old. But I find it quite remarkable 
that the so-called liberal media in my lifetime has become the conservative media. And, well, and the, not just conservative, but right-wing, uh, narrow, like you say, not reflecting the spectrum of views in this country, which is very diverse. Um, it, that's what's so frightening that I, I can remember in the 60s, Spiro Agnew yelling out at all of us in college with the liberal media and the press and everything. And now it's, it's gone completely 180 degrees the other way. And, and yet there are still some people who will talk about the liberal media, which I find quite amusing. <laughs> well, I don't know that there ever really was a liberal media because the, the media itself was It's always, owned by wealthy always co owned corporate by, magnets, right? Yes. Who are people, mostly Republican. That's right, yeah, by people who are fairly conservative. I think it's true that uh, people out uh, you know, doing the work, the reporters, many of the reporters, I think, were m much more liberal than the owners of the, of the stations and the people who controlled uh, the editorial content, for, for example. But the situation today is, as you say, very, very different. So what are we doing? What we're trying to do now is change that. So we've had this fight that I, I tried to describe in the Congress to roll back the June 2nd decision, and we were only partially successful. Mm -hmm. However, I'm introducing legislation, and the, the, the bill is already written, and it's, it's in, the, in the Congress. That will, there are two, two approaches I'm taking. One is a more modest approach, which would just roll back the early, the, the most recent decision, the June 2nd decision, by the Federal Communications under President Bush, mm -hmm. Federal Communications Commission, rather, under President Bush, having to do with the fact that one entity can own more TV stations, more radio stations, more newspapers within the same marketplace. So we're trying to roll that back, and I've introduced a resolution in uh, the House to do that, and, I've, and I'm going to be pushing that uh, beginning in January when we return to Washington. Right, Secondly, I've introduced legislation which will go back to what I regard as the initial offenses that were created against the American people, against the general public, back in the 1980s, and uh, attack this consolidation as it began back then, and also reinstate the Fairness Doctrine, which would allow people to have access to their own broadcast spectrum, to their own media, allow the American people mm -hmm. once again to have access to the media so that points of view of the general public can be expressed rather than the single yes. point of view of whoever it is that owns the station. Okay, well, thank you very much for clarifying all this, and I hope you're successful. I sincerely do hope for everybody's sake. Um, thanks very much, and thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you. Stay tuned for part two. Back to the Joanne Michael Show. My guest is Maurice Hinchy for the full half hour. Maurice, we have discussed all this media conglomeration. I don't know if there's a, a word for what's going on in the media that's easy to say, but whatever. Do you? Do you? I don't know what, what you call it. What's happening? But I well, it's monopolization. Monopolization. Yeah. Okay. It's consolidation and monopolization. What we're seeing is. The federal government, under this administration and going back to the Reagan administration, has allowed the Federal Communications Commission to permit the increasing monopolization of the media by a smaller and smaller group of people. The idea behind that is they don't want a variety of points of view. They want to drive home their particular point of view and convince the American people that that's the right point of view. And the best way to do that is not to have people exposed to other points of view. So that's what we're seeing, the yeah, monopolization yeah. of the media by, by the government. It's, it's, the, uh, it, it's the kind of complex of corporation and the government working together against the interest of the American people. I don't think most people perceive the government as, and these corporations and, and the people as being so negative or having an agenda. Mm -hmm. But it's something that's quite subtle even though it's on there every time you turn on your television, it's there if you really think about it. But a lot of it is subliminal mm -hmm. control over what people are thinking, and, and it's, it's very frightening. But one of the things that they've been able to use the media in this way is with the war in Iraq. Yes. And I was wondering if, since you were, and my hat goes off to you, one of the few people who voted against going into Iraq, and time uh, proved that you were correct. What you took a lot of flack in this district for that. I remember <laughs> yes. that. Yes. 
but maybe you can, now that we're there, maybe you can tell us what do you think we should do? Since you knew, you were right about it originally, maybe you can. Now that we're there mm -hmm. and things are a mess and it's really quite, it's horrible what's going on. Right. What, do you, uh, what do you think we should do now? Well, Joanne, I think it would be useful for us to just spend two minutes maybe just going back and looking about how, how we got there. The, uh, the weapons of mass destruction that we couldn't well, yes, find, right? You know, we, we were attacked uh, on September 11, 2001 by the Al-Qaeda network. Now this was... A Not the Iraqi government. No. The Al-Qaeda network led by a man named Osama bin Laden. We were attacked by this network, which is a, a relatively small group of radical Muslim fundamentalists who come out of the so-called Wahhabi fundamental uh, approach to Islam that originates in Saudi Arabia. Those people attacked us for their own reasons. They're like a band of organized international criminals, and they used airplanes to execute that attack. Now, for some reason, that is not entirely clear, I mean, I have my own point of view about it, the Bush administration then focused on turning attention away from Al-Qaeda toward Iraq and Saddam Hussein. Now, I think this President Bush had his own personal reasons for doing that. I think Donald Rumsfeld and people like Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl, who are very, people who were appointed by this administration to the Defense Department and are very instrumental in making defense policy in the country now, they had their own point of view and their own reasons for wanting to go after Iraq rather than after Al-Qaeda. And they were successful in doing it. But they painted, and this drove me crazy too, they painted Al-Qaeda as being connected with the Iraqis mm -hmm. and Saddam Hussein, which had they had nothing to do. In fact, as I understand it, and I, wrote, I read a book on, on all this, they hated each other. So how could, and we in, at one point supported Saddam Hussein's uh, government oh. very, very strongly. We sent him out. So how could most Americans, 50% I think it is, think that these people just because they're in that part of the world are all connected? Yes. And, and that's a big misconception. So well, how, d during the Reagan administration and the administration of the first President Bush, those two administrations used our government, first of all, to take Saddam Hussein off the list, take Iraq and, and, the, and the government of Saddam Hussein off the list of international terrorists. In other words, they neutralized them in that regard. And the Reagan and the Bush administration, the George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush, supplied Saddam Hussein with what, what has come to be called weapons of mass destruction, biological and chemical weapons. We gave them chemical and biological weapons in the 1980s, right up to 1991, just immediately prior to the Gulf War. Just immediately before the Gulf War, the first Bush administration was supplying Saddam Hussein with chemical and biological weapons. We gave them more than $2 billion in direct cash and credits to buy weapons and, and for other, other purposes. So. Um, what you're seeing, and there's a, there's a long story that we, we maybe we'll go into another time as to right. what happened there and why they wanted to do it. it involves Bechtel Corporation right. and a pipeline to pump oil from the Kirkuk oil fields over to Aqaba. All of that was behind what the Reagan and, B and Bush administrations tried to do, the first Bush administration tried, tried to do. Now they are claiming that there are weapons of mass destruction there, and they claimed, as you mentioned a moment ago, that there was a connection between the Al-Qaeda network and Saddam Hussein and the Iraq government. No connection existed, just as you said. From the point of view of someone like Osama bin Laden, who was a very fundamental religious person, from his point of view, Saddam Hussein was an apostate. He ran a secular government, he wasn't practicing the Islamic religion, and uh, he was someone who was, who was just, just almost hated by Saddam Hussein by Osama bin Laden, yeah. rather. So th there was no connection between them. The only connection that, that might have been between them was an antagonistic one, not in a, any connection that enabled them to work together. But from our point of view, there was oil there. So maybe they, our government just said, hey, 
let's go in and take it over. It's out of 9-11, we might as well get something out of it. I mean, what kind of thinking? Well, I, I, think I, I don't understand. I think there were a lot of reasons. I think that some of them had to do with oil. I think some of them had to do with personal issues involving the Bush family. I think some of them had to do with political issues. In other words, the president wanted something that he could overcome in order to demonstrate his effectiveness as a president in the re-election effort of 2004, which takes place next year. I think all of those reasons were involved in the Bush administration's attack on Iraq. And it was the Congress of the United States which surrendered its authority under the Constitution to this administration to conduct the war essentially wherever and, and under whatever circumstances it wanted to. It was a gross abject uh, uh, denigration of, uh, of authority and the giving of authority unlawfully to, to the uh, executive branch of government. And I think that that's with been... No, with no plan for what's going to happen after the war is over. Or no, no plan. plan. And, and so this is what's troubling most Americans, I think, is, okay, we went in there, we know what... Uh, it, we could be there forever. It could be worse than Vietnam. But, so what now? We, we, they have no electricity, they have probably dirty water. What have we really done? We've killed a lot of their kids. We've killed a, a lot of our boys have been killed by guerrillas for now. I mean, what, so what now? What's the plan? I guess we're all trying to understand, what was the plan after we won? They didn't have a plan. We always win. They, they didn't have okay. a plan. Okay, how could the con well, I guess the Congress didn't have much to say about going in there, right? No, the Congress, the Congress gave its authority to the administration. The Congress behaved very, very badly. Um, well, then you people are to blame. <laughs> well, yes, but of course, <laughs> I, not I, you personally, I, can, I, can, I, I, I argued the other way. Right. I argued the other side of this. I argued that the Congress shouldn't do it, and I voted against the resolution, and if more people had done that, we wouldn't be in this particular position now. What we should have done is continue to work through the international community and with the international community through the United Nations. We had no reason to invade Iraq, and the invasion of Iraq has not created a situation where Americans are more secure, it's created a situation where Americans are less secure. Because what the invasion of Iraq has, has, has done, it's enabled the radical elements within Islam, the people like Osama bin Laden and the people around him and several other smaller radical elements mm -hmm. under different names within the, the Islamic religion, to unite. And it's enabled them to say to other people who they are trying to convince to join them, look, what we've been telling you from the very beginning is true. Don't you see it? The United States is fighting a war against Islam. Mm -hmm. Why else would they have invaded Iraq, an Islamic country that did nothing to them? They are determined to des destroy Islam. Therefore, you need to come with us, unite with us against America and against the other Western countries to help us carry out our terrorist activities. So the war in Iraq has not made the United States or the Western world more secure. It has, in fact, made us less secure. Then why do 50% of the people in this country think George Bush is doing a great job and they are behind what he's doing? How can 50% of Americans be so wrong? Well, I'm, it, I'm just asking, does that have to do with what we talked about, the information? Yes, <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. Okay. It has to do with what we just talked about a few moments ago, or what we talked about in an earlier portion of this, uh, of this program. And that is that the information that people get is not complete. The information that people get in a lot of, a lot of the parts of this country is inadequate and it is focused on a particular point of view. I was at a, uh, a media conference in New York City recently, just prior to the one that we talked about on another occasion that, that took place in Madison, Wisconsin. There was another one that was held in New York City. I went there and, and spoke at that. I met people from all over the country there. A number of people, I'll just mention one in particular, a man from Houston mm -hmm. came up to me and he, and he said, what you're saying is exactly true. I live in Houston and except for the two public broadcasting stations, I think one was radio and one television, except for the two public broadcasting stations, everything that you hear is one point of view. And with regard to the Iraq, it's a pro-war point of view. It's a pro-administration point of view. It's George Bush's right point of view. It's what Rumsfeld wants to do is absolutely correct point of view. That's what people hear over and over and over again. And if you are told, it's like the big lie technique. 
If you're told something over and over and over again, and there is inadequate opposition to that which you're being told over and over and over again, almost inevitably you're going to believe it. Most people are going to believe it, and that's what's happening to people in this country, particularly in the midsection of the country, in the south, in the southwest, in the lower midwest. People out there are not getting the kind of information that people on the coasts get. We get more information out here, in, in, in New York particularly, but in California, Oregon, Washington, throughout New England. On the, on the two coasts, we have much more access to information than people do in the central part of the country. And that's why you see that kind of point of view expressed particularly among people in the I south, in the southwest, in the lower midwest, that whole vast section of the, of the country, the mountain states, that whole vast section of the country is exposed to the same information over and over again as a result of the consolidation of radio and television in the hands of just a few people. But you would think, it's interesting because Houston, Texas, well Bush owns Texas I guess still, right? But Houston is a fairly uh, sophisticated city with people from all over the place. I mean there is the oil business, there are people, and it's interesting that in a city like Houston even, mm -hmm like New Orleans probably, probably a lot of those southern cities. That is an issue, that is a problem. That's interesting. I, I wouldn't have thought in a large city like that yeah. that was the case. Well, a lot, a lot of large cities increasingly uh, find themselves in that, in that kind of situation. So public in radio that part of the and that, public radio and, and the kind of um, option, that which is fantastic. I listen, I'm in the car a lot, I listen to public radio. Mm -hmm. they, they have, uh, incredible reporting on that. Yes. A lot of that's people in this country have turned to the BBC. Right. That's a lot of people in this country increasingly are trying to get information from outside of the United States. Now isn't that interesting? This is a country that is based upon a constitution, a written constitution, and enshrined in that constitution as the principal part of that constitution are the first ten amendments. The first ten amendments, many of which were forged here in New York State. The Bill of Rights, in effect, was hammered out in the city of Poughkeepsie back in the eight, <laughs> I didn't know yeah, that. back in the really? in, in the eight, in the eighteenth century, yeah. the Bill of Rights essentially was hammered out in the city of Poughkeepsie and, and to some extent in the city of Kingston, a few other places. But in in this state principally, what's the first of the Ten Amendments? What's the first of the Bill of Rights? The first amendment to the Constitution: freedom of speech. Freedom of speech freedom. Because the founding fathers recognized and understood clearly that if people did not have the right to express themselves and the right to hear other points of view without interruption, without censorship, then the democracy was doomed. Could you repeat for the audience, the TV audience, what you said off camera about what happened in Europe during World War II? How the oh, sure. Effect, because I think that the audience should hear that. That was fair. Well, we were, very talking, we were talking about uh, how the Federal Communications Commission was established in 1934. In 1934, there was no television, but, but, and radio was relatively new. So the federal communication was established in order to make clear in law that the broadcast spectrum, that in those days the radio broadcast spectrum, was owned by the people of the United States, all of the people, and not owned by any individual or any corporation. And it was also established that the people had the, uh, the right of access to that broadcast through something that was called the Equal Access Clause or the, or the Fairness Doctrine, which enabled ordinary citizens to have access to the media, access to broadcast. Now the reason the Federal Communication did that was that, among other things, it was informed by what had taken place and what was at that moment in 1934 taking place in Europe. And that is the use of fascist powers in places like Germany, Italy, Spain, and, and elsewhere to control the government by controlling the media. The first thing that they did was to control the radio and the radio broadcast so that everyone in those countries was getting the same information over and over and over again and no other point of view. Federal Communications and the government of the United States saw that. They saw how fascist regimes had come to power in Europe and they were determined that that wasn't going to happen here in the United States and that the radio wasn't going to be used for that purpose and so the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, was set up to prevent that from happening. But in the meantime, beginning in 1984, the Reagan administration first, the second Bush administration, the first Bush administration, and now this Bush administration is undermining those rules and regulations of the FCC 
and also the law upon which they're based, so that people do not have that kind of access to the media any longer. And we are seeing the increasing monopolization of the media, radio, television, newspapers, the internet, cable vision, in the hands of a handful of people. This is, a, the, this is the greatest danger to this democratic republic in the 228 year history of our country. Thank you. But it's, again, I, I'm, I'm glad you explained it because it's very complex. And that I thought was very, very interesting about how that happened. And, and it's going on right now with TV. It has a practical basis. It didn't just come about because somebody thought it might be a good idea. It has a practical basis based upon experience, and that experience was in, in those European countries particularly that I mentioned. What um, I think another big concern many people in the Hudson Valley have is about the environment. No administration that I can remember has ever undermined. I mean, I think President Clinton, one of the things that he was able to get through was a great deal of environmental legislation. And I don't understand how they're able to roll it back so easily. How does that happen? Well, a lot of what uh, the Clinton administration was able to do with regard to the environment was by executive order. Because once the Clinton administration was elected, they were elected in 1992, they, were, they had one house of the Congress in the hands of Democrats only for two years. And then the Republicans took over in, uh, in the election of 1994. So from 1995 onward, for the last six years of, of the Clinton administration, they weren't able to get pro-environmental laws passed through the Congress. Are you saying the Republicans in Washington are anti-environment by and large? Oh yeah, for the most part. Yeah, not all of them, but the vast majority of them are. Yes. Because I don't see the environment as a, as a partisan issue. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, it shouldn't be un un until you, you, you think it might not be, un unless you look at the record. And it turns out that it is a partisan issue because there are corporations, businesses, that are interested in exploiting the environment. There are corporations and businesses that are not interested in complying with existing environmental law. And the Republican Party is very, very close to those corporations and, for the most part, is willing to do their bidding. You saw it in a different context with the passage of the Medicare bill just recently, how the insurance industry and the prescription drug industry dominated the debate and the results of that Medicare bill and how the insurance industry and the prescription drug industry, the pharmaceutical industry, are the primary beneficiaries of that Medicare bill. But returning to the environment, you have corporate interests, for example, that are very interested in cutting the timber that is located on federal land. Why? Because they can do it very cheaply. They can get that timber at a much lower price than they could if they would, had to go out and, and get the timber and cut it off land that is owned privately. They'd have to pay a lot more for it. Mm -hmm. So they're very interested in being able to go out and cut the trees on public land. The Bush administration has rolled back the requirements put into place by the Clinton administration which restricted that activity and so you are seeing more and more clear cutting of trees on land that is owned by all the people of the country. That land is located in the West, it's located in California, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, and, and Montana, and a lot of places like Doesn't that. Doesn't the Congress have to vote on that? No, not if it's done by executive order. If it's controlled by executive order, it can be uncontrolled, it can be reversed by executive order, and that's what the Bush administration has done with regard to the cutting of uh, land on, uh, uh, cutting of timber on, pro on public land. Also, there are corporations that are interested in exploiting the natural resources that may or may not be located on public land. Again, the reason is they can do it much cheaply, much more cheaply, because of a law that dates back to the 19th century, which essentially allows the exploitation of natural resources on public land at a very, very low price. So if you want to go in and drill for oil on public land, it's a lot less expensive than it is on private land. If you want to go in and extract coal from public land, it's a lot less expensive than it is to do it on private but land. But why doesn't the government charge the corporations a because lot of money? The government, a competitive they, amount. The right. government has been dominated in this regard, on this issue, by the interests in those western states where these resources are mostly located. And that's why it hasn't been reversed, in spite of the fact that many people have tried. I'm 
one of those people who are trying to do that now and has been have been for some time by making more areas that are owned publicly more of the public mm -hmm. land to be put in the category that gives it a greater de degree of, protect, of protection in Utah, for example, and, and, and other places. Okay, we're talking about the environment. What else has the Bush administration done other than allowed the, the gross exploitation of natural resources on public lands? Well, they have undermined the Clean Water Act by allowing, by rolling back a provision that was put in by the Clinton administration by executive order controlling the amount of arsenic that right. can... And mercury. I just read about that. Yeah. There was something like that. That, the water. that can be allowed in public drinking supplies, public water drinking supplies. The Bush administration has eliminated that executive order so that more arsenic will be able to be found in public water drinking supplies. This arsenic, in many cases, comes about as a result of mining activities and other, other kinds of activities in which uh, the corporations are, are involved. The president is very interested in rolling back a provision of the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act dates back to the mid-1970s. One of the provisions in the Clean Air Act came about as a result of negotiation. There were very intense negotiations that came about to establish the Clean Air Act. People were interested in, in establishing the Clean Air Act because they knew that the air was coming, incre becoming increasingly polluted as a result of the burning of, of uh, uh, coal, for example, mm -hmm. high sulfur coal, and, and a result of other activities at power plants and manufacturing establishments and various things of that nature. So the Clean Air Act was fought out in the, 19, in the 1970s. One of the provisions in that Clean Air Act that came about as a result of compromise and negotiation was something that was called, and still is called, New Source Review. Here's what it said. It said, okay, you are, say for example, an electric generating facility. You're burning high content sulfur coal. You're putting out a lot of pollution. We're not going to require you, as a result of the compromise, to put in state-of-the-art pollution control devices right now. But the moment you upgrade your facility, the moment you, you make improvements internally, the moment you, or, or the moment you expand your facility to produce more electricity and have to burn more coal, at that moment, you will then have to add state-of-the-art pollution control equipment so that the amount of pollution coming out of, that, of those stacks will be cut down. And the acid rain that causes problems in the Catskills and the Adirondacks and here in the Hudson Valley and on the, on the Mohonk Ridge and, and elsewhere will be substantially reduced. Now, that wasn't the best of all worlds because it gave the people who were engaged in those pollutants a lot more time to, to bring their pollution under control. But at least it was, it was seen as a major step forward because one could anticipate a, a moment when those pollution control devices would have to be put on right. and the pollution would be abated. Now, the Bush administration is eliminating new source review. They are, they are creating a situation where, in spite of the fact that the plants have been upgraded, in spite of the fact that the plants have been expanded, those plants will not have to comply with the requirements in the law that, that makes them put on the new pollution control devices. But isn't that an executive? That's not an executive order. No, Wasn't this, that is a, this, is legis this is that legislation. legislation. This is so legislation. How, that, this how can they do that? They can do it because they control both houses of the Congress. And all the Republicans are going to line up against the environment, and all the Democrats are going to line up for it? Is it's that not, how it goes? No. It's, unfortunately, it's not that simple. <laughs> you have most of the Republicans lining up right. against the environment in this particular case. I think it's fair to say that, that it is against the environment. And you do have a few Democrats also who come from those parts of the country which are affected in that way, which will, which, which will benefit, and, and they are joining them as well. And that's the situation that you have. But the initiative is coming out of George W. Bush and his administration. That's the point. Absent that administration, you would, you, 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 you would not have this situation. Right. The law would, on, everyone would have to comply with that table. law by, a partic by the time they upgrade it. That's correct. Uh, they would have no choice. Yeah, they would have to because that's what the law stipulates. Now they're yeah. in the process of changing that law. See. I also, as I understand, in the rebuilding of Iraq, 
uh, Mr. Cheney and all his friends are, because Mr. Cheney was, he's, I think he sat on the board of Halliburton for many, many years, and I think he, he still has friends. That, you know, the, one of the things I would like you to talk to is how involved and how in bed is this administration with corporate America? So much so, and again, the media is not reporting on this connection because of the, all the things you talked about and we discussed. So we have a vice president and his cabinet and all these people who stand to make millions, if not billions, from what's from dis decimating this country and rebuilding it. Maybe that was, maybe we should have just given Dick Cheney a check for a million dollars and skipped the war, as they said somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Is it, I mean, to me, to my way of thinking, if you follow the money, in this administration, you usually get the answer. Well, that's right. That's, that's my point of view also. And if you look at the two major corporations, American corporations, that are benefiting from the war, Bechtel and, and Halliburton, you see that that's the case. Bechtel, uh, Rumsfeld was very much involved in, in, uh, with, with Bechtel. George Shultz, the former Secretary of State, headed up Bechtel, and I think he still does. Uh, the, the Halliburton uh, corporation and its subsidiary Kellogg Brown and Root are very much involved in Iraq and Dick Cheney was the chief executive officer of Halliburton and therefore Kellogg Brown and Root before he went back to the administration as vice president and I and think if he gets out of office in November he'll go you back. can be sure he'll be back he'll at be back. Halliburton that's correct correct that's correct yes. doing all the stuff that he was. so we have to wrap up I know this is so complex and I'm sorry I asked you this at the end of the show <laughs> But what's a, what is an ordinary citizen to do? I mean, really, this is so depressing. Well, let me say that, first of all, there is some <laughs> reporting of this going on. The New York Times had a very good story on the front page of the New York Times very, very recently talking about how the Bush administration is exploiting the war in Iraq to make money for their friends. So how they, they talked about how Halliburton is selling gasoline to the, American, to the Americans, to the Army Corps of Engineers, for a price of between $2.64 a gallon and $3.06 a gallon, in spite of the fact that Iraqis are buying gasoline for less than half of that price. <laughs> and the Halliburton is doing this uh, through a subsidiary, an Iraq subsidiary. They're giving the contract to an Iraqi company. They are engaged in all the, all the difficulty, all the, all the hazards of traffic, trucking that gasoline from Kuwait, for example, 400 miles up to uh, up to Baghdad and on every gallon Halliburton is taking a minimum of 26 cents just for being the middle person the middle company the middleman in that enterprise they get the money from the federal government they hire these people and they take 26 cents maybe they're even getting a kickback from that Iraqi mm -hmm. company because the Iraqi company is still making more money obviously than uh, other Iraqi companies that are importing gasoline in to sell to uh, for other purposes, and they're outside of the activities of our government. So it is, I think, quite clearly an example of government corruption in league with corporations. And yeah. greed, just plain greed yeah. on the part of these people. And I, I would like to have you come back because we're out of time. <laughs> okay. But you're doing a great job, Maurice, and I, I really urge all of you out there in my listening area, which is largely Republican, to really think about what you're doing when you vote nationally in November of next year. Thank you for all the reasons we just heard here. I've, it's flooring. It's depressing. It's at least it's and the unfortunately, truth. <laughs> unfortunately, it's all true. And unfortunately, it's all true. Yeah, that's what this show is about, telling the truth, right? Anyway, thanks again, Maurice, for joining me. I really appreciate your coming. I know you're busy. And um, good night.